Tell us briefly what you do in Vienna. Well, I'm a retired professor by now because I have reached the magical age of 65, but I still teach two simultaneous interpreting classes. And uh, until recently, I've also been involved in uh, supervising MA and PhD theses. Okay. And we've been reading your work over the years, basically in interpreting the field, work on, on the practice and theory of interpreting? Or? Yes. Uh, I should point out that you were Pinter before you became Kurz. Yes, and right, so uh, some of the my early PhD articles. thesis uh, was published under my maiden name. Um, see, I studied psychology and interpreting and translating at the same time. And uh, at that time, which was way back, uh, of course, you could not get a PhD in uh, interpreting. Mm -hmm. uh, I got my PhD in psychology. And fortunately, I found a topic that was interesting to me, and that was the influence of practice and concentration on simultaneous speaking and listening. So it was not really interpreting, but speaking and listening, because this ability is something that impresses lay people uh, first and foremost. And uh, I found out that uh, actually uh, this is a skill that can be acquired uh, fairly easily. And, of course, there was a difference between uh, non-interpreters and interpreters and students who had some experience. So it was, you know, one, well, actually it was the first uh, empirical study of simultaneous interpreting, or simultaneous speaking and listening, mm -hmm. I should say. And, uh, yeah. Does that feed into the training process? That sort of discovery, I Definitely, think, yes. 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 Because uh, you're probably aware of the fact that there have been people who have uh, recommended shadowing, that is repeating you know, what someone else says, as a pre-simultaneous exercise. And there has been a debate going on, some people saying, well, this is not only useless, it's harmless, it's harmful. Uh, others saying, no, it's a useful exercise at any stage of training. Um, Repeating or shadowing is not interpreting. And being able to show that um, actually this skill can be acquired fairly easily means that, at least to me, you should confine shadowing to the early stages mm -hmm. of interpreter training. Yes. So I use it for a very short time period just to make my students get used to hearing their own voice and someone else's. Uh, it's also good for sort of... Um, imitating a native speaker, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, it's something else uh, than interpreting. Is, is there a problem between the research community and the practicing interpreters for things like that? I mean, if you find something in research, is that well enough known within the, the community of trainers, for example? I would think so, yes. Uh, most of the trainers uh, nowadays have a theoretical background. Yeah. Yeah. but they should also have a practical background, of course. You, you've done other things of real interest over the years uh, on brain activity mm -hmm. during interpreting. Mm -hmm. yes. There was a talk you gave once in Copenhagen on, I forgot, alpha or gamma. Oh, yes. or, can you tell us something about that? <laughs> sure. Sort of well, it seems I've been dabbling in a great many areas, uh, which sort of coincides with uh, my wide range of interests. And um, uh, this neurophysiological study was part of my habilitation, the postgraduate mm -hmm. uh, thesis. And I was fortunate enough to team up with uh, the then head of the neurophysiological department, who was very much interested in languages. And, um, in, in Vienna? In Vienna, yes. yes. And he had carried out EEG studies on different uh, groups of subjects. For instance, he compared musicians with non-musicians and how their brains responded to music. Um, so he had uh, prior data available, and uh, I suggested a study comparing uh, electrical brain activity during shadowing, during interpreting into one's A and B language, meaning mother tongue, first foreign language, and also while doing arithmetics. And then uh, people listen to Mozart music in between, which sort of establishes the alpha rhythm, which is 
the activity. Well, I emphasize you were in yes. Vienna to yes. do this, okay? <laughs> right. <a> good Austrian. <laughs> <laughs> so when you are relaxed. Mm. And what we found basically was that um, both hemispheres are involved during interpreting. The left hemisphere is responsible for language processing. But, you know, one shouldn't localize um, any activity in a particular brain area. What matters is the uh, connectivity, uh, which areas are involved. And uh, during interpreting, uh, practically the entire brain was involved, more so when the interpreter was working in, into his or her foreign language. So that is an indication that there might be a greater strain, you know, during that kind of activity. Uh, shadowing was similar, but involved less activity. Uh, doing calculations showed completely different brain patterns. And we had one um, interpreter who was not really sure about her mother tongue. And uh, her uh, brain activity in both languages was very similar. So these were some first uh, experiments, but um, I think they are very interesting. Not so what, much. What was the effect of Mozart? Well, they were very much relaxed and they showed alpha they rhythm. Yes. <laughs> um, now, I think this is the kind of research that will not have an immediate impact on interpreter training, for instance. You know, what good does it do to you uh, if you know that while working into your foreign language there's more involvement of the right hemisphere? Fine. But it's basic research and it's probably more interesting for neurophysiologists. But uh, I think it's the kind of research we also need. You, you were doing that research quite early on. Has it been picked yes, up um, satisfactorily, well, do you think? Um, a Finnish group um, has taken up um, physi neurophysiological studies, only uh, they didn't use EEG, but uh, functional MRI. So they got results which um, in part confirmed my findings and in part did not. But then uh, neurophysiologists will tell you that a great deal depends on the method that you use. Um, with the EEG, you can observe changes um, in brain activity over time, whereas the functional MRI gives you a snapshot, so to speak. But uh, I think uh, this kind of research is going on with a grant from the EU, as okay. far as I know. Okay. I haven't been following up because uh, my uh, professor is now uh, no longer active, and uh, a lot, you know, as you well know, depends on the interest of a particular person. And that determines the course of research to a large extent. Tell me briefly how you, 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 you're a conference interpreter, you're yes. still working as a conference oh, yes. interpreter. How did you get into the research community? Was it a natural progression in some way? No. In fact, uh, for years I was just working as a conference interpreter, freelance. Uh, then um, I started teaching at the interpreters department, uh, teaching practical classes like consecutive, simultaneous interpreting, originally even translate, uh, translation exercises. And then uh, our department uh, got a chair in translation studies. And that was the point in time for me to decide, well, do I want to become a member of the research community? Uh, by that time, I had already participated in a number of conferences on interpreting, and I found that, uh, well, there were a lot of people who were not practicing interpreters, and they came up with all sorts of theories which didn't seem very plausible to me. So I thought, well, why not, you know, test that? I mean, hypotheses are fine, but they need to be tested, and every theory needs to be, uh, well, empirically proven. So I got interested, and it was sort of a natural uh, consequence of my having studied psychology and interpreting. Um, because there was a point in time when I had to choose between psychology or interpreting. And um, I had been working as an interpreter already, and then when I got my PhD, I was offered an assistant professorship. And uh, 
I wasn't sure whether I would want to do that. And I found, well, psychology is one of my interests, but interpreting gives me the chance to do so many more things. So I decided to work as an interpreter. But then, having this job at the university and uh, being given the opportunity for my habilitation, because we got a chair in translation studies, that more or less decided it. And I have never regretted it. Is it easy to keep working as a conference interpreter and, uh, and as a university professor? Well, of course you wish the day had 36 hours. But uh, I was fortunate, yes, I did manage to combine it to a large extent. Of course you have to sort of uh, give up an assignment uh, because you, know, you have to be at the university. So you always have to find a compromise, and, but it, it can be done. One question I've been dying to ask you for years. I, I love to cite uh, an article you wrote on the princes of Elephantine <laughs> as overseers of dragomans. Yes. Okay, so well, see, yeah. how, how did you find this? This is, I think, one of the first references to interpreters in the world. Um, uh, how did you come across this? Well, I came across an article that was published in the 1950s by hmm, three people from what was it, uh, Heidelberg or another uh, German university. And they had uh, written about this. And I thought that you know, was worth exploring in greater detail. And uh, I took a trip to Egypt. And I made a point of you know, looking at. Um, and you checked that it was there. I checked, <laughs> okay. yes, uh, okay. the inscriptions uh, uh, on the island of Elephantine. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you start looking for material, it's amazing you know, how much you find. And I just thought it was so interesting you know, to look at the history of interpreting. I mean, take any profession, like the medical profession or lawyers, they are interested in the history of their profession. So that got me started. And uh, I then wrote an article about uh, Romans, you know, and oh, how yes, they used yes, interpreters, yes, yes. and uh, what was it, another one about uh, the Incas. So, I mean, this is a field of research which I find fascinating. What sort of research should young doctoral students be doing on interpreting? What, what's really needed these days? What is needed? I think they should uh, take up a subject, a topic which really interests them. And I can see so many different aspects, like the cognitive processes involved in interpreting could definitely be studied in greater detail. Uh, quality is another area where uh, colleagues in Granada, together with uh, the University of Vienna, are now running a major project in which I'm partly involved, um, where you could you know, look at the history of the profession or the history of uh, professional associations. You could look at economic aspects, like uh, or the status of the profession. You know, what was the status of interpreters, let's say, in the early 1950s, when there were not so many interpreters, compared to nowadays, when you have, uh, I don't know how many uh, people working for the EU Commission, uh, on one single day. Uh, there has been a decline, I would say, in the status of the profession. Really? But yes. Yeah. Yes. That's at least but this not, is what... Not in the pay. Um, oh, yes. Really? Yes. Um, interpreters at the beginning uh, were better paid compared to other professions. Nowadays, this has sort of leveled off. But, I mean, these are things... Uh, which interpreters will answer intuitively, but that could be studied in much greater detail. And, uh, do, do you think the research should be done by people who, who are conference interpreters, who have the, the professional skills? You, you uh, mentioned that you were unhappy with what the professors were saying. Well, before. I think if you have someone who uh, is a practicing interpreter, plus has the qualifications to do research, that's the ideal situation. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that non-interpreters uh, cannot do qualified, you know, very good research. Uh, but I found that, for instance, when AIC uh, paid for uh, comprehensive studies, 
uh, carried out by psychologists on stress felt by interpreters, or we had another big study, the workload study, uh, we really had to tell these people, first of all, what the profession was all about. So there were, you know, preliminary interviews, otherwise I feel that they wouldn't have come up with the right questions all the time. So a combination, Good. I think, is best. Okay. Thank you very much. Professor. Thank you. Okay. It was a pleasure. Thank you.